Uh, my name is John DeGraff. Uh, I live in Seattle, but I am running for vice president on the Bretton Roses Party ticket, and we're actually on the ballot, uh, on the, the national ballot in Vermont and in the state of Maryland and possibly one or two other states that we're, we don't know yet, but we are not on the ballot in Washington state. I don't think I've heard of that political party before. Would you mind telling me a little bit about it? Sure. Uh, it's a new party. Uh, started a couple of years ago in the state of Maryland and was on the ballot there. It was started by a, a Professor Jerome Siegel, who is a philosopher at the University of Maryland. And the idea behind the party is really educational for the most part. We're not under any illusions that we're going to get elected <laughs> president or, or vice president. But uh, And we are only running in uh, very clear blue states where we cannot tip the election possibly in any way. Uh, we certainly want uh, Donald Trump to be defeated and Joe Biden actually to be elected president. But uh, in states like Vermont and Maryland, where they're very safe states, uh, we think that maybe some of the slightly disaffected Bernie Sanders and other supporters may come out and vote for us and uh, and then maybe vote for other progressives down the ballot. So we actually think we're probably doing the Democratic Party a little favor uh, in those states. But our, our point is to raise some new issues to get all people – to whatever party and organization talking about them, which is uh, what we mean by bread and roses, is it's a it's a long historical tradition in the United States uh, from the basically 1910, 1912, when uh, suffrage leaders, women suffrage leaders, spoke about uh, that human beings have a need for bread and for roses. The bread was the material side of life, so money basically to buy. Uh, housing and food and clothing and those kind of things. But the roses was the non-material side of life that we don't pay enough attention to in politics. So that's enough time, so shorter working hours for people so they would have time for their lives, art and beauty uh, in their lives, which includes, of course, the pr protection of natural beauty, which includes uh, the support of the arts and uh, artful communities, uh, things of that sort, uh, community con uh, social connections with others. These, we believe, are political issues. They are not purely private issues, and that we can devise, design society in a way that will enhance our ability to meet these needs as well as our more material needs. Yeah, when someone's working multiple jobs, it's hard to have the uh, energy to consume or even create any kind of like art. Yeah, well, absolutely. And, and uh, we live in a society that's kind of obsessed with consuming consumerism of the material kind. Uh, I am uh, I was a producer at KCTS in Seattle for many years. I produced a popular PBS uh, national documentary called Affluenza about overconsumption in America and its impacts and how we really are focused on stuff to a very, very great degree. I wrote a book along that topic. Uh, Jerome, my running mate, the presidential running mate, wrote a book called Graceful Simplicity during the Voluntary Simplicity Movement of the late 1990s. So what we were saying is we need to stop being so obsessed with consuming more and more stuff and working very long hours to buy all the stuff, and we need to be much more focused on some of the things that money really can't buy, except in a public sense. That is, we can make our cities more beautiful. We can purchase land uh, for parks, uh, for all those kind of things. That That can be bought, but it's a public good rather than pure private consumption. I think you touched on this a little bit about why – you're not running as a Democrat, but could you talk about the, the special challenges of running as a third party? <laughs> well, well, the biggest challenge, the challenge is that we, we don't have any money, so it's a little bit difficult to uh, carry out much of a campaign <laughs> without that. The other challenge is that we'd hope to be on more ballots, although obviously, as I said, we don't want to be like the Green Party in the last election or in 2000 and actually can be a spoiler because in our mind, uh, the defeat of Donald Trump is absolutely job number one right now. I mean, he's a disaster for the country, for roses, for everything any of us hold dear. And uh, so we've got to get him out of office. But once we do, I think we need to start thinking about some things that the politicians 
is I'm thinking about. And those are the roses, these non-material things. For one, one example, I uh, helped write uh, a bill uh, that was introduced into the Washington State Legislature by Gail, Gail Tarleton, state rep, who's now running for Secretary of State. It was a bill that would have provided paid vacation time for people in Washington State. We are the only uh, rich country in the world and, and one of the very, very few countries in the entire world that doesn't require paid vacations for workers. Now, that's an example of the roses. It's giving us time. Uh, so uh, one of the, the, the challenges is, is simply to get known, to get out there. So I appreciate being on your podcast. And we try to do what we can, writing for publications and such, to, to get our message out. But what we hope eventually is uh, not that we're going to win and, and put any of this stuff into place, but that if they see a little bit about us here and there, that other folks uh, – maybe Democratic political leaders, maybe even possibly some Republicans will say, hey, those are good ideas that we need to pick up on and then we need to, to build legislation around. In this country, it seems that, um, you know, hard work is a virtue, but not just hard work. It's working yourself almost to death is almost like something that's admirable. Yeah, yeah, not only just to buy the stuff, but also as a badge of honor. You know, I... I uh, I don't see my family because I'm killing myself uh, uh, at work, but that's how it is because that's what what it means to be an American. You you work like crazy if you die trying, and uh, you know that's not a good life. And all the other wealthy countries in the world, especially the European countries, recognize that. When I go to Europe and I and I have spent a lot of time in Europe and uh, talked a lot of politics with people in Europe, and what they will always say is. You Americans are different from us because you live to work, and we, on the other hand, work to live. Uh, you Americans are just crazy. In fact, the first thing you ever ask anybody that you meet is, what do you do? That's sort of the, the deal. It's this badge of honor. I, I do this work, whereas we Europeans might ask people, what do you like to do, uh, which is a whole different ballgame. Or we might ask you, ask them about their family and their friends and things. We would never start the conversation by saying, what do you do? But you Americans are obsessed with what you do. So is this considered sort of um, a socialist party or is this kind of like an evolution of that? Well, you know, there are certainly aspects that we borrow from the socialist tradition. Um, we we certainly believe that contemporary capital, corporate capitalism and unregulated capitalism as, uh, of the kind that we see in the United States is pernicious. It's destructive. It is. Uh, results in enormous inequalities and 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 in enormous environmental destruction and, and in, in enormous other problems for the society. So we do believe in what you might you know, what Bernie Sanders calls uh, democratic socialism in in the sense of a society that would have considerably more regulations on the market that would have uh, a, a, a much greater safety net for people. So we look to to the to countries like uh, the Scandinavian countries and the Northern European countries that are called social democracies. Uh, so, and we draw from that tradition, but we draw from other traditions. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this whole idea, again, of roses really comes from, in some ways, from a, a more uh, early uh, 20th century anarchist tradition uh, or uh, the, the women, the, the suffrage movement, and, and we're about to hit 100, you know, uh, next month we're going to have the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage in the United States. And uh, as the suffrage leaders traveled around the country, that's what they said. They said, when, when women get the vote, we'll pay more attention to the things that women care about, like families and love and art and beauty and nature and all of those things. Uh, and we need that for that purpose. So Helen Todd, who was a suffragist leader in in, uh, in Illinois, was campaigning in 1910, and that's when she made that first statement saying, uh, uh, you know, women want 
bread, but we want roses too. And we may want to make it so all the children in America and all the men and everyone else gets the roses as well as the bread. So we draw from those kind of traditions. We draw from uh, the voluntary simplicity tradition, like the Quaker tradition, uh, all of these these kinds of things that are part of our our history as Americans and that we've forgotten. I mean, we had a movement in the early 1900s in this uh, country called City Beautiful. Its purpose was to create parks and, and, uh, and our Seattle park system, our whole system of interconnected parks was essentially for the most part built in that period between 1905 and 1915 when the City Beautiful movement was uh, had so much influence in America. Uh, we uh, we we are uh, uh, inspired by, for instance, the poet Vachel Lindsay, who's a very famous populist poet of the early 1900s from uh, Springfield, Illinois, who actually walked across parts of America, like he walked from Springfield to Santa Fe, and he would carry nothing. He would stay and depend on the the generosity of the people, mostly farm people, rural people that he passed to uh, give him a place to stay and some food. And in the meantime, he passed out these leaflets. He would, he would read poetry for people, and he passed out these leaflets that he called uh, the Gospel of Beauty. And he wrote a book called Adventures While Preaching the Gospel of Beauty and said, you know, this is, this is what we need to do. We need to make all of our towns and cities beautiful places so that people don't have to have their life all about consuming uh, individual goods and stuff, but they, that they have a good place to live. Uh, we're, we're drawn by the uh, beautification movement of Lady Bird Johnson and Lyndon Johnson uh, uh, during the 1960s. Uh, we're, we're attracted to the, to the work uh, of the, the first New Deal around environmental restoration and, and all of those kind of things. So there are a lot of traditions that go into it. So, we, you know, we don't mind the label democratic socialist, but we're not talking about nationalizing every, everything and having the state own everything, nothing like that at all. You talked about how things are a little bit different in other European countries. Why, why is America so odd in this? <laughs> well, you know, I think the power of capital, uh, big corporations has been greater here. Uh, I think we also had this frontier mentality. You know, the, these European countries were more populated. They were smaller, and people had to, to work together. Um, they, you know, they had to come together. You take a little country like the Netherlands, very small country, lots of people. They actually had to learn how to get along, work together, and create institutions that would benefit the whole. Otherwise, everybody got hurt. But here in the United States, there was this sense of elbow room, that there was all all this land to the west, that the frontier was there for the taking, and that this it was all about, you know, get what you could for yourself, and the, the self-made individual man, or, uh, well, they always said man, <laughs> women too, but it was the, the term they always used was man, because things were very gender biased in those days. Uh, but that, that was the sense that, you know, this is freedom, is the idea, just go out and be on your own, do the the things that don't have government or anybody else make any rules or decisions for you. We still see that. We still see uh, things in this stuff you not in this country that you do not see in Europe. Europeans would not be out there at state capitals carrying rifles and saying we don't want to put on masks. That would, that does not happen, and it's one reason why. Coronavirus is so much more serious a problem in this country than it is in those countries that have basically beaten it. Well, with this kind of philosophy, how would our approach to this pandemic be different? Well, it, it would be, I think, uh, some of the places, I mean, our, our, our governor and our state health department, I think, have done a reasonably good job of basically telling people, look, when you're out in public, you wear a mask. We shut things. We don't open things too soon. We follow uh, the, the guidance of the, of, the, of the health departments, and we look out for the common good, not the individual right to do whatever the hell I want, no matter who gets sick. 
uh, I think that's what we would. And, and you know, to some extent, we've done a pretty good job here. Uh, I think uh, watching the state as a whole looks more like the European countries in terms of COVID than, uh, say, Florida or Arizona or Texas or some of the other southern states where this fierce independence and anti-mask wearing behavior has taken place. And, and also, those countries don't have Trump. I mean, to put it simple, everybody I talk to in Europe thinks that America's crazy. It's gone crazy. How could we have elected such a buffoon uh, and such a self-centered, narcissistic son of a bitch who, who is, you know, wrecking the country step by step, destroying environmental regulations that that we worked for decades and decades, decades to create, destroying the hopes of laboring people and unions and things that we worked for decades to create. Um, this is appalling what we're seeing today. So, you know, that is for us as the Bread and Roses Party. We, we want that stopped first. Before, Otherwise, there is no Bread and Roses. There's no future for us. Uh, we're If we get four more years of this, we are uh, well headed down the road to a fascist state. So we believe act, absolutely that we we have to get rid of Trump. But when we do, and when we come out of the coronavirus, do we run a return just to the old normal, the way it was, where we were consuming like crazy, spending like crazy, working like mad, uh, and increasing global warming and uh, environmental damage and all of those things, or do we want to create a society where we understand that we can be happy with less stuff? We need social connection. We need nature. We need a good environment. We need good health. And part of health is not just health care. It's living in a healthy uh, environment. So, so that's what we want to come out of COVID. We want that to be the new normal, uh, not the normal that we went in with, which is kind of obsessed with this notion of increasing the gross domestic product, the GDP, uh, and so that the whole idea is, you know, we're number one if we make the most stuff that can sell for the most money. That's not the future, and that if we continue to believe that, you know, frankly, I think we're doomed. So, you know, our politics is so dominated by the two parties. Um, there's a big debate on the left about whether or not the Democratic Party is even kind of redeemable or what we could do. I mean, we've seen recently with, I think, their platform votes of that they're more conservative than the average American. Um, do you think that the Democratic Party is in any way redeemable? Like, can we fix the party? Well, yeah, I think I, I think at this point it isn't so much a matter of whether it's redeemable, but that there right now is no is simply no serious alternative that um, can, you know, we are really, we need right now uh, to work very much with the Democratic Party and Democrats, because at this point, they are the most progressive major party in the country by far. Now, does that mean uh, we can't have eventually some other parties? No, I mean, I hope we can. But I think that our system, our, our so-called democratic system, which is far less democratic than the parliamentary systems of Europe, doesn't make it easier. Easy. It's got a winner-take-all uh, thing that that you know really means that if you spend go too far out on the line on a third party, you basically hand the election to the party you like least, you know, and and so that's not true in Europe. Small parties have uh, can can gain five percent and they can get a, a people in parliament, and so they they don't they can, and they can focus on particular issues now. Where I would go on this is, and what I like is when we see things like the state of Maine uh, and now uh, uh, some other places is ranked choice voting, where you, we could go in into the polls um, and we could vote for the Green Party, the Bread and Roses Party, whoever it is, some kind of third party. And then our second choice would be the safe choice of the Democrat, but the votes would be counted. So we would say there are people who really want to see this agenda, and it's their first choice. I think if we could do that, we could push both push the Democratic Party to be more progressive than it is. And I think it's becoming more progressive. I, I think that the general trend with the Democratic Party is good. Bernie Sanders made a lot of difference, and I very much admire 
what Bernie Sanders was able to do. I'm not one of these people who who says Bernie or bust, you know, because I, I I think that's a little crazy given Trump. But I do think that the Democratic Party is moving in the right direction. We need to push that. And if we got some rank choice voting and things like that, we could we could push it in a stronger way and we could allow the development of third parties, which I also think we can do anyway at the local level. Uh, you know, I, 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 I know friends in Wisconsin who were Green Party people who uh, won uh, in local cities. Uh, they got positions and they actually had great influence in local governments. I think that's a very important place to start. But when you do it for president and you take the risk of reelecting Donald Trump, that's just politically nuts. We're just about out of time. Do you have any final thoughts for our listeners? Yeah, I just hope that, that people will take a look at our, our platform, Bread and Roses Party, breadandroses.us, uh, and that and we have a Facebook page, and, and that they'll consider the ideas that we're putting forth. One of them is, uh, in addition to the Green New Deal, we believe America should have a Beauty New Deal, and that's based on a lot of the arts uh, programs and things of, of the old New Deal, but it's also based on environmental protection and those kind of things. We think that if people look at what we have to offer, um, they will say, hey, I want to support this sort of thing. I want to push my representatives to do this sort of thing, whether they're Democrats or Republicans or whoever they are, because it's the right thing to do. And if they're in Maryland and Vermont, I hope they'll vote for us. And if people want to learn more about you, your campaign, and the party, where should they go? Uh, to breadandroses.us. That's the website. And then there is a Facebook page called Bread and Roses Party. Uh, so they can go to either of those places. And, you know, there's been a little few things written about us, but uh, I'm very glad to have this opportunity to, to talk about what we're about, because I, I think a lot of people believe in these, uh, these kind of ideas, and, and they believe that we've got to have a less materialistic, more uh, human, more, more uh, social connection, more environmental kind of society. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Hey, thank you, Jason. I really appreciate you taking time to talk to me. You've been listening to Talk to Seattle, and I've been your host, Jason Rigdon. If you liked this episode, would you please share it on social media? Most podcast clients have a little share button. Click that and tell people why they should listen. If you want to support Talk to Seattle, would you please give the show a rating and review on iTunes? It really helps new people discover the show, and it makes me happy. Follow Talk to Seattle on Twitter at Talk to Seattle. And email any questions, comments, or suggestions to jasonrigdon at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening.